joy it is to be in this place this evening. Will you turn with me in the program to the insert that brings on it the words and music to our opening hymn, To God Be the Glory. And will you sing with me?
everybody else. So as we bow, let's, let's lift up prayers for each of these dragons. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight in thanksgiving for each graduate that is here tonight. Each are a delightful blessing from you. I ask your blessings over them as they step out into a world that is full of violence and hate. May each one be a beacon of your light in a dark world. Put those in their life that can help them make a difference. Lord, you are an awesome God. Be with these young people. They sit here tonight composed and flat, but it is so hard to contain all that energy, that eager longing to break free and fly on their own wings. But there are other emotions here too. After graduation, the class will not meet together like this again. <coughs> Friendships will change and the safety net of teachers and counselors and coaches will no longer be in place for them. May it prompt them to seek your guidance and help them to stay focused on the path they have chose. As we send them forth, Lord, we ask blessings upon them. Grant them the wisdom and the will to make sound choices. Lead them to discover their true calling and joy and grant them faithful friends to help one another. Give to each patience and suffering, perseverance and struggle, and the protection from your holy angels. God of great joy, remind each of us that we are loved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In Jesus' name, amen.
for many of the class of 2000. Perhaps the best example I can think of of the class spirit and willingness to sacrifice came in your planning and carrying out the complicated activities for the junior prom. Some of you tonight have accomplished your goals in very visible and outward manners. Others in a much less visible way. But to all of you, I say a job well done. As the American poet Robert Frost once said concerning education, it is hanging around until you've caught on. The class of 2000 has hung around long enough. It's time for the future. Thank you. Let us pray. God of new beginnings, our youth face the future not knowing what the days and months will bring. Be with these young men and women as they continue on their journey of life. Fill them with hope. Be their rock, shelter, strength comfort and support. May they face bravely and enthusiastically the responsibilities ahead of them. May compassion flow deep within each one of them till they taste the tears of their brothers and sisters. May they face bravely the responsibility to preserve and care for the beauty of the earth. And may each of their lives be filled with enthusiasm for life. May the word we are about to hear be in their minds, on their lips, and in their hearts. Most of all, Lord, fill each and every young man and women here this evening with your peace. Amen.
Mistakes were corrected by simply exclaiming do over. Race issues meant arguing about who was the fastest. Money issues were handled by whoever was a banker in Monopoly. Sure, you remember those things. And if you have, you've lived. And now you've come to this time and this space. And I've been asked to talk to you. I've waited six years to talk to you. Some of you I've talked to for a moment or two. I'm hoping that tonight I can tell you my story. Because each one of you is going to live and is living your story. And when we mix those stories together, we have community. We have living together, experiencing together, and being together. The problem is, oftentimes we forget. We don't build memorials. Now, I was out at the, the cemetery. You say, well, that's kind of a dead place to be. Yeah, it is. And if you look on those tombstones, some of them don't have any writing on them at all. And others have, day born, they died. Maybe a little scripture verse. It's that space in between, that little dash, where you live your life. Now, the text for today said, don't forget. And pass it on to your children and to your children's children. You know, the text that I want you to remember has to do with how you should live your lives. I guess the thing that I want to tell you first, because I want you to understand where I'm coming from, and a lot of you don't know me, even though I've been here six years. So I'm going to give you a story. When I was about nine or ten years old, I was playing in my dad's stepfather's car. My sister was in the back seat, and she was playing too. We went out into the house, had dinner, and my stepfather came back in to take that car and drive down to work. The car wouldn't start. The lights had been left on. He came storming back up into the kitchen, screaming at me. That's pretty good for a man who's both deaf and dumb. And he indicated he wanted to know who turned the lights on. Well, I'd been sitting in the front, and I'd been playing driver, but I didn't remember turning those lights on. My sister had been riding in the back, and she'd been playing with her dolls. And she was older than I, but she had not been up in the front. But I told him that I didn't do it, that I didn't think I had. He beat me with a coat hanger. Pretty bad one. And I was sent to my room. Then my mother came and she said that if I didn't confess that I had left the lights on, that he would beat me again. So I confessed that I'd done it. Really thinking, no, I hadn't done it. Guess what? I got beat again for lying. I couldn't win because I had lied. I had not told the truth. And I learned something from that. And I tried to pass that on. I plan to pass that to my grandchildren. I passed it on to my children and to their children's children before it's over with. If you're going to get in trouble, at least make it for the truth. At least the truth as you know it. Look on what I'm wearing tonight. The seat of my cross is a little different. And that cross is a cross that was sold to raise funds for Columbine. One of the great tragedies in our Western world. I believe that we have to make a difference and we have to stop the violence. But that violence doesn't stop until we understand what's good and right. It doesn't stop unless you get involved. Until you do something about it. There's a violence that goes on everywhere. That's why I'm part of the Domestic Violence Committee. We call it the SAVE Committee. 
I'm also part of Project Blessings Food Bank. I run a preschool. I'm the cup master. I try to get into this community and do whatever it takes to add to this community. And so I want you to know that I care. I care about you. I care about your kids or the kids that you're going to have. So my message tonight is going to be a little extreme, and I haven't even started it yet. You see, some people think that people who are retired cover it all enlisted, one officer, and also pay grades in between there, except handsome. So I've been around, and then I started making money. That seems to be important too. It's not. It just helps pay the bills. All right, let's get on with the story. Then. I thought maybe I ought to tell you a little bit about me beforehand. Tonight I brought with me my shadow box. In that shadow box, you'll see that there's a coat hanger. When my children and grandchildren come and see the shadow box, they say, they don't say, tell me the story, because they know the story, but their children will ask about the cocaine. In that box also is a box of cracker, or not cracker jacks, uh, Rice Krispies. I'll tell you that story first. I was on the USS Forrestal. I was a chief warrant officer. I had about 80 men that worked for me in the engineering department. We were working up to deploy to the Mediterranean. And we had heated up the catapults to do launching of aircraft. There was a hot deck, that's the floor that was hot, in one of my birthing compartments. And being part of the fire party, emergency uh, response team, I got there right away. The rest of the fire party was there and they were getting ready to pop the hatch open. In that same place where they were going to patch, pop the hatch open were eight men sleeping. I asked them right away, did you clear this compartment? They said no. So we got them out. Had they stayed, they would have died. My point, God will have you at certain places at certain times to do specific things. We popped that hatch open. We had oxygen breathing apparatuses on. It looked like gas masks with a, a bag in front where the air is being made. It's the only time in ever fighting the fire down below decks that I've ever seen the flames. They were popping up about this high. For you people who can't see me, it's about as high as my shoulders. We fought that fire. That deck or that void was about the same volume as the volume of one set of bleachers. And we're fighting it through a little hole, trying to hold it down. What had happened is that, that the supply people had pulled the, the metal bars that would have kept the, the stores from getting up against the hot pipes. And they got up against it because they'd taken the bars out because you could put more in. We had a raging inferno going. It wasn't long. First of all, you couldn't see. You saw the flames initially, then it was all smoke. It was all dark. You could not see. Um, you close your eyes and see more light than with your eyes open. And so you feel the heat and you're fighting a fire and all of a sudden my OBA quit. It would not give me any air. I moved. I was first man on the hose. I had the nozzle of the firefighting in my hands. So I moved the guy behind me up onto the hose. I turned to move away from the hose. I got lost in that compartment. That compartment was about 15 feet by 15 feet. It's not all that big. But I was totally lost. I can't breathe. Panic, I dropped to the deck. I felt a hose, a fire, a charged fire hose. And I said, oh, follow this and I'll get out. And so I started scampering. I learned how to do that crawl when I was a little kid. And what I ended up with a nozzle in my hand. 
had gone the wrong direction. And I was coughing and sputtering. I had stripped the mask from my deck, from my face. And I thought that's it. And I said, God, is this it? Is this what it's all about? And then a voice in my head said, you can get good air from a nozzle. That's what it said. I snapped the bale open. Water's pouring out of it. And sure enough, you put your head down by the bale, you can get good air. That's why I'm standing here today. Now, I'm telling you that God is real. He will help you if you trust in Him. I'm telling you my personal experience, my story. I don't expect you to believe because of my story. But my believing in Him caused me to trust Him and to face towards Him. My reading of the Scriptures has taught me that God is real. And He showed me that day that He is real. And so I stand here today. In that shadow box, there's a set of glasses. When I was on the USS Midway, sailing in the Sea of Japan or in the Sea of India, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, we go up on deck, go back down, and see nothing. Water everywhere. Because of your work, you might go out once a week to find out where you're at. And it really doesn't tell you because there's the water. No, that's fine. It hurts your eyes. It's so bright out, so you go back down. I crawled up into where I slept. I had a stateroom, shared it with two other people. And while I was sleeping, the Lord Jesus Christ came to me. Now he said, oh, come on. Yes, I had the vision. I had the Isaiah vision. I saw him. And I know it was him because he told me, I died for you. The other thing that he told me was very simple. I expect better. That changed my life. He expects better. Better than what we normally give him. But you know what? When he told me that, I didn't feel like I, I was getting chewed out. It was like he was prophesying where I was going. And in his presence was a presence that I can't describe it for you. It was wonderful. I didn't want to leave. I didn't want him to leave. But he told me what he had to say. And he left. That vision has helped me personally, and it was for me personally, in a lot of the difficult situations that I've been in. You see, when everything is going wrong, and everything would try to tell me that there is no God, and all the mess that people make, that there's no reason for trying to stick it out and try to make it work, I remember the vision. And nothing else really matters. Well, sounds like a lunatic so far, especially a Lutheran lunatic. No Lutheran does what I'm doing now. It's a little car, little red sports car in my shadow box. I used to have a 1988 red Camaro. Beautiful car, and when the kids didn't have it, I got to drive it. We lived in Ramona, California. To go to work in Oceanside, I had to go down about a 2,000 foot hill. It was about five miles long. On the side going down, there was nothing. At places you could drop as far as 1,500 feet. I was in a hurry that day. There was a car in front of me. It was a windy two-lane uh, two road. There were no pull-offs. Well, there would be one in about two miles down the line. 
And so I hit that thing to go around this slope rope that was in front of me. The moment I got parallel with it, a car popped out of nowhere that had been hiding in the road. And I was headed for a head-on collision. There was only one thing to do, and it wasn't break, because the guy next to me was trying to break. I hit the gas and I jumped up in front of him. I was doing about 85 to 90 miles an hour, and I was coming on a turn that was about 60 degrees. I made that turn. But the next one was going to really be tough. I'm trying to slow up as fast as I can and not lose control. This car's coming the other way. Where it swings back around and goes the other way, it's almost 160 degree turn. And right dead center out from that used to be an area where you could pull off. But there was a great big motor home sitting right there, and there was no place to go. I'm still doing over 60 miles an hour coming up on this mess, trying to get down, but not losing it. And I feel a presence take over. Just literally moved in and sat in me, sat on me, whatever. And I was totally calm. I went through that curve at less, at about 45 to 50 miles an hour. I never broke rubber. I should have been a tangled bunch of steel and flesh. And it was different than any other close call that I've been in before. Because it was calm, cool, and collective. It was like I wasn't doing anything. I was just observing and watching the TV. And when it was all over with, and we made the turns and slowed down to reasonable speed, it was gone. About three months earlier, I'd gone through much the same thing on the freeway. When a limo had spun out and was going across right in front of me, and I was coming at it about 70 miles an hour with a pickup truck. And I'm sliding into it, and I see an open spot, and I gas it, and I go. I got through the hole, and then I couldn't get the thing to go 45 miles an hour. My heart was pounding so bad. This was nothing like that at all. Again, God had a purpose for me. And he broke into space and time. And so I have a red command. That bottle is supposed to be a bottle of diesel fuel. On board ship, we take this stuff on all the time.
does touch our hearts. And let's close that way tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we do bow before your holy name and your righteous statement tonight in your word. We do have a great message to carry on to generations to come. We thank you for the ongoing work and prayer that is required for these lives. We would just trust them now to the next aspect of teaching and 